Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Peter was now in his old age and gray hairs flecked his temples. He had served his Lord and Savior for over three decades at the point that he writes the letter for today. He had suffered very much for the name of Jesus and he had seen a whole lot as he spread the good news of Jesus to the world. He had gone to the far reaches of the earth to share the good news of Jesus, but also he had spent time in cities like Antioch for years on end, telling people of the hope that they had of eternal life in a very real and living Savior. But now the church was undergoing persecution wholesale. It wasn't just a few people here and there, the disciples undergoing persecution. Now, as the church grew, it was each and every Christian that was having to suffer for the name of Jesus. It was during what was called the Neronian persecution. A few weeks ago I mentioned this. And Peter watched as his brothers and sisters in the faith scattered around the ancient world were suffering. Some of them were thrown in prison for their faith. Others were tortured and still others were killed. Some had their property and land taken from them by the state because they refused to submit and worship the emperor himself. They stuck out with their friends and family, Gentile families from whom they had been called, families that lived in pagan idolatry and unbelief, but individual Christians now witnessing for the good news of Jesus among their families and friends. They stuck out like a sore thumb, and this drew the hatred of the unbelieving world. See, we're told in the scriptures that Christians are the stench of death to the unbelieving world. We point out what is right and wrong, what God says is his will for the world, but we also hold out that only saving truth of Jesus Christ as the one who suffered and died for the sins of mankind and rose from the dead to give us eternal life. But there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. If you want to be in heaven, you must believe in Jesus. Otherwise, you will not be there. You will be someplace very different. You'll be in hell. And so as the early Christians proclaim this, especially in the ancient area of Turkey, what is in the Old Test or New Testament, sometimes referred to as Asia Minor, Peter knew that the church was being tested through fire. And he knew that what they needed most at this point was encouragement so that they would not give up that certain and everlasting life that they had in Jesus. That they would continue to be rooted and established in his love and power that was at work for them. That he had ascended into heaven and now ruled all things for their good. He was preparing a place for them. And so now they needed to bear up under this suffering to keep running that race until they got to the goal of heaven. And so in our text for today, we'll see Peter give them direction on how they can maintain their faith, or rather how they can respond in the midst of this persecution that is taking place across the empire. You imagine, too, as Peter wrote this letter and as he conducted his ministry for 30 years, many of the words of Jesus surfaced in his mind as he waited to be called home to glory himself. He himself would be crucified on a cross in this same persecution. But you imagine that he would have thought about the words that Jesus spoke as the disciples sat on Mount Hermon listening to Jesus' greatest sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. And when he says about Christians that they will experience hatred for believing in Jesus. But when that happens to rejoice for their names are written in heaven. Or perhaps with sorrow and shame very many days he remembered when he had looked to himself and his own strength and power but in time of testing had turned away in that courtyard of the high priest and he could not even list himself among the friends of Jesus. But also then he would have remembered Jesus' incredible grace as he appeared to him in the resurrection to assure him his sins were forgiven, but also then even appeared to him on the Sea of Galilee and shared with him his love, asking him, Peter, do you love me? Okay, you do. Now go and feed my sheep. Feed his sheep is exactly what Peter did. And now he would have to feed this ancient church, this new fledgling church at his day and time, in order to keep them going in order to sustain their faith and help them through this persecution. So in our text for today, we'll see the same for ourselves. When people hate us, when people ridicule and mock the message that we share, how is it that we as Christians can respond in the face of persecution? And now listen to what Peter says as he speaks to these people scattered around the ancient country of Turkey. Dear friends, 
Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal, or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed. But praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? We're going to focus on the very first verses. The way that we can respond to persecution and the way that he told them to respond was the same way Jesus told the disciples to respond. When you are hated and insulted and persecuted, do not get down on yourselves. Do not be overwhelmed and depressed. But instead, rejoice. Rejoice because it means that you are marked as a child of God. You are truly one of his followers. And you have the hope of heaven awaiting for you. You have nothing to be afraid of. Because even if they would take your life, which most often doesn't happen to Christians, though for many of these Christians listening it did, even if that should happen, you are now delivered to the glories of heaven. You are now going to see your Savior face to face. You're going to look him in the eyes and wrap your arms around him. You are going to be at the goal that you have worked towards all your life. So do not let your hearts be troubled. Instead, rejoice when persecutions come. Tell me. As Christians who trust in Jesus and believe that the gospel is the only thing that can save people, as you hold to the Ten Commandments and know that this is God's truth for the world, and you look at your friends and family that maybe don't believe, or you look at the world around you, what kind of thoughts do you have when they might ridicule and mock you for what you believe? Is it our first reaction to say, oh man, I'm so happy. I'm so great that this is happening. I'm so great that they're making fun of me and they're making fun of my faith because that means I really am part of Jesus. Or is our first reaction very often, I think, this? To freak out and then to complain about it all the time. I see it in myself. I see it in brother pastors. I see it in you as Christians. And I see it also in people that might even be commentators on our society or politicians. Whoever is focusing on all the things that go against God's commands for what he wants for each and every single human being. We could even call it things like culture wars, right? And Christians get so adamant and so upset and so frustrated with what is happening, we very often forget what Jesus himself says here. To rejoice when these things are happening. Not to get angry, not to get afraid, but instead look to Jesus and trust in him all the more and realize that this is a badge of honor. Some of you might have family members that have served in the armed forces. I don't know if any of you that have, have a purple heart. Maybe you know some people that do have purple hearts. They went into war to sacrifice themselves for their loved ones for their country, for their fellow citizens, and they were taken through the fire. They were injured. And now because they were injured and they came through the other side, our government wants to recognize the, the privilege, or rather the honor that we should give to them for doing so for all of us. And they get that purple heart, this badge of honor that can be pinned on them. When you think about the suffering that you have to undergo for testifying for Jesus, Think of it as a, a medal of honor, a badge of honor, a purple heart. You are testifying for the sake of Jesus and speaking of his name, and then people want to take you out for it, but God brings you through it. He puts you through that fiery ordeal and brings you through the other side, and when you see that happen, you can realize, God in his grace has given me the spirit. I have contended for the faith. I have fought the good fight. Not because I have the strength, but rather he gave me the strength and he stood by my side. Consider it a joy then when you have that badge of honor that marks you as a Christian. Because if you didn't believe in Jesus, would you want to suffer for him? The obvious answer is no. Only people that believe in Jesus are willing to undergo that ridicule and mockery for him. 
but then see everything that he said too on the night before he died when he told people that he had overcome the world. He's overcome it for you and for me and his victory is ours. We didn't celebrate Ascension, um, but we are kind of celebrating it today. It was this last Thursday. And the Ascension is a very important celebration in the history of the church because Jesus is now ascending into heaven to prepare things for his church, his people. And that means prepare things for you and me. But he also ascends into heaven to be that king that makes sure he rules in wisdom and justice for his people. That in the moment, as people ridicule and mock us, it can seem as if we are on the losing side. But when Jesus comes again, and through the eyes of faith as we look to him, we see that he vindicates us. So when people say, you're just filled with lies, what you believe is not the truth, you don't know anything, you're old-fashioned, you're outdated, why do you believe those archaic principles and beliefs? Why do you believe in somebody that rose from the dead? That doesn't make any sense. We simply say to ourselves, and to them, I don't care what you say. I know it's true. And I pray to God that one day you know it to be true too. But I'm not going to give up Jesus. How could we give him up? He has given us everything. He saved us from hell itself and given us entrance into everlasting life. He's taken us from fear of sin and death and given us a life sheltered in his peace and in his love. Think about a picture from the Old Testament from Psalm 92 or... or I think it's 92, no, it's Psalm 91, where God says that as a, a, a hen gathers its chick under its wings, God gathers us under his wings and he is our refuge. He protects us and keeps us safe. Or in 1 Peter, in this book, he talks about the shield that God uses to protect us by faith until he should come again. Instead of lamenting how society is turning out, Instead of taking our eyes off Jesus and fixing it only on all the things that are wrong in the world. Instead, rejoice. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. That they might ask, what is different about you? Because if you are insulted and persecuted and hated, most people, what are they going to do? They're going to lash out. They're going to get revenge. They're going to give a clap back. They're going to want to say something back. But a Christian, a Christian who is doing as God says, as they rejoice, will bless. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Do good to them and pray for those who persecute you, Jesus says. And even for all the times where we have failed to do that, for all the times we are grumpy and inward turning, Jesus has washed it all away in his perfect record too. Because Jesus found joy in suffering. Why did Jesus find joy in suffering? Because he was a masochist? No. He found joy in suffering on the cross for you because of you. He wanted to make you and me his own. And the fact that he could accomplish that through suffering then led to him rejoicing and giving glory to God. Or you think too about what Jesus proclaimed from the well as he, as he talked to that Samaritan woman and his, his disciples came back to him. They said, oh Jesus, you need to eat, you need to have some food. And he said, I have food that you know nothing about. My food is to do the will of the one who sent me. He found great joy and sustenance um, inwardly by proclaiming that good news of Jesus and holding to the word. By sticking to it no matter who rejected it and who accepted it. We can learn from that. We are forgiven in his perfect record and at his cross. But now we live in the assurance of his resurrected glory. That he will defend us and protect us. So how can we respond in the midst of persecution? Rejoice. Rejoice because our names are written in heaven. But there's one other way then this morning that we see in our text that we can respond as we encounter this persecution. If you'd go ahead to chapter 5 verse 6, this is also what Peter says. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind, your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, 
firm and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. We're going to focus on two of his commands in this section, which are really one and the same thing. How else can we respond to persecution? Humble yourselves and cast your anxiety on Jesus. He's really saying, humble yourselves by praying. Don't think that you're going to control this life, that you're going to control the chaos of the world. Don't think that you can even turn one hair on your head a different color. But instead, humbly see that your loving Savior, who rules all things, is in control, and He knows best how to protect you and keep you safe. So instead of being filled with anxiety, instead of being filled with worry about your spiritual battle that you're undergoing, first of all, don't freak out. But secondly, when you do freak out, turn it over to Him and say, Lord Jesus, I need your strength. And what does God promise to give us when we ask Him? The Holy Spirit. He promises to give us what is in accordance with His will. And is it in accordance with His will to strengthen you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast? The answer is unequivocally yes. Of course, every single day He lives to do that for you. And even when we don't pray to Him to do that, in His faithful love and mercy, He continues to sustain that faith. Look even at the very last verses where He says, The God of all grace, who called you to His eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong. He's the one that does it. Oftentimes our hearts are filled with anxiety and worry. Why? Because we look at ourselves. Because we think it all depends on us. We think we have to be the one to fix the situation that we're in. Well, when it comes to our spiritual fight, can we actually do that? The answer is no. The only one who can rescue us is Jesus. Because we have an enemy. He's prowling around always looking to devour our faith. And, and how do lions kill, by the way? Some of you know how lions kill. Very often they try to choke their prey. They try to suffocate it. I won't get too graphic with that. But in this section then, really what Peter is saying is the lion's goal, the devil's goal, is to suffocate your faith, is to choke it out. It's the same thing as what Jesus says when he's preaching the parable of the seeds that are sown. And he says some of the seeds that are sown spring up. People have faith, but their faith is choked out by worry. The worries of this life. We often think of other sins, other vices as the things that can kill our faith. Oh, I better avoid all of those sins of the sixth commandment because those can kill my faith. Okay, true enough. But any sin can ultimately do that. Worry is a sin against the first commandment. We don't see God as the one who is all-powerful and all-loving. And we begin to think that maybe he really can't help. So, for instance, let's say you have family members and friends that don't believe in Jesus. And you talk to them about it, and they say many different things. And the devil comes to you with certain temptations like this. You know, if all of your friends and family members and loved ones believe this, and you don't, could it be that maybe you're wrong? Or when we don't consider that they're possibly right because they're not. The devil comes at us with a different tack trying to suffocate our faith. And he says, if you're going through this right now, if your friends and your family members don't like you because of what you believe, I thought Jesus said he really loves you. If he loves you, why is he putting you through this in the first place? And instead of putting the blame on himself, of course, or on the wickedness of others, he tries to get us to doubt God's goodness and Jesus' love. There's many other ways that he can come at us. Maybe it's this too, this final temptation. You see how so many people are set against Jesus? You are all alone in your life, in your struggle, in your battle. Are you going to be strong enough? Are you going to endure to the end? Are you going to persist and keep on fighting? Now, I don't know if you will. I don't know if you have the strength to do so. And he tries to get us to worry and to take our eyes off Jesus because that's what worry and anxiety is. Taking our eyes off Jesus and thinking that we can solve it. But what is the antidote to worry about our spiritual battle that we're in? The antidote is always to fix our eyes on Jesus, the one who lived and died, but now has risen for us. He ascended into heaven, and on that day that he ascended, do you remember what he told his disciples? He said that he would come back for them. 
And also, as he ascended, what did he tell them as he sent them out into the world? He didn't say, okay, just go do your own thing. I'll just go up to heaven. I'll be up there. You can manage on your own. You'll be fine. No, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. He was telling them, I give you my authority. I give you the tools to work faith in people's hearts. I have given you the mission and you know how to accomplish it, but I will be with you as you go out into the world. You have nothing to be afraid of. No reason for fear and anxiety. Just trust in me and know that I am with you. Have I ever forsaken you in the past? If I have never forsaken you in the past, will I forsake you now? Will I forsake you in the future? The answer is no. And is your faith due to your struggling and your power and your ability? Or is your faith due to the fact that I work so powerfully in you? Now, I worked that faith in me and my sacrifice. I worked that faith in you when I called you through the waters of baptism. I sustain that faith as I feed you with my body and blood in the sacrament. I sustain that faith as I talk to you in my word where I tell you, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Rejoice when you experience this persecution because you have that badge of honor. You have that down payment of the Holy Spirit guaranteeing what is to come. But also know that every anxiety you have, no matter what anxiety it is, just come and lay it in my more than capable hands. Because the hands that were stretched out on the cross for you now are extended in resurrected rule over the world and in powerful protection over you. I shield you and keep you safe. We're told also in the book of John that God has us tightly in his hand and no one can snatch us out of it. But one more picture. If the devil is a powerful lion, Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah that is even more powerful. The Bible uses that picture of Jesus too. The lion of the tribe of Judah. And he is our friend. He is not safe. He is good. And he comes to protect that which is own. Just imagine that you had like a pet lion, right? Just imagine for a moment. And you had trained it to guard you and protect you better than any guard dog that you could get. Would anybody mess with you? The answer is no, no one would mess with you. How much more when Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, is at our side. He is not our pet. Rather, we are the ones that he protects. And so he comes against Satan every single day for us. He already did at the cross. But every single day as we are engaged in spiritual warfare, we don't have to fight. Jesus does. And he comes and he sinks his teeth into Satan and tears him apart and throws him aside with his powerful jaws and then stands by our side to keep us safe. He will not let us go because he is strong. And what does he then do with this strength? Even when people threaten us, even when we are hated for the sake of his name, even when we feel weak and helpless and afraid. It's the promise that Peter gave at the very end of this lesson. At the very end of his letter and what we're going to end our sermon with today. Are you afraid? How can you respond in the midst of persecution? Rejoice because Jesus in his resurrected glory is preparing a place for you. Your names are written in heaven. How else can we respond? By not being filled with anxiety and worry as we humble ourselves and lay our lives in his hands. But also now as we remember that he goes before us to protect us and keep us safe. He will keep us strong, firm, and steadfast. Now the closing words once again of the letter from 1 Peter. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Please stand now as we join in.